its neck. We now know that the fractures of the neck were devastating to Hughes. There is no possible way that you or I or anybody's gonna have an accident this bad and not have pain the rest of your life. What Hughes did to control his pain became the most guarded secret, massive drug use. Hughes relied on a combination of painkillers, codeine, Valium, and Emperin, which he took almost daily. But the pain and multiple head injuries clearly affected his behavior. Over the next 10 years, his drug use would increase dramatically, and his obsessive compulsive disorder would spin out of control. And another devastating disease would cast a long shadow over his soul. When Howard Hughes first moved to Hollywood in 1925, he brought with him a wife and an enormous sexual appetite for other women. By the time of his plane crash in 1946, he was long divorced, and his list of Hollywood conquests was as long and impressive as his aviation achievements. But the way he related to women would only add to his mystique and his reputation for strange behavior. He was very addicted to beautiful women especially women who were brunette and kind of buxom. Howard Hughes was the ultimate breast man, no question. The most obvious evidence of his obsession with the female form was on display in his most controversial film, The Outlaw. It featured a voluptuous Jane Russell, whose revealing wardrobe, specifically ordered by Hughes, brought outcries of immorality from censors. You came back. At his best, Hughes was charming and generous, showering his women with gifts. He's also a man who liked to please women, by the way. He uh, was kind of a sexual pioneer, all right? He was big on reading sexual handbooks. Hughes sort of approached it mechanically. But Hughes was emotionally unable to sustain any deep relationships, and he refused to allow anyone to get close to him. He was more of a compulsive girl collector, with several relationships going at the same time. And he tried to keep them all secret from one another and the public. It didn't always work out that way. In April 1953, a salacious tabloid named Confidential published a detailed account of his personal life under the headline, Public Wolf Number One. This infuriated Hughes. They had an issue showing that Hughes had several girlfriends. He couldn't have that because his present girlfriend would be reading it. So he sent us all out to buy all the magazines. A small army of Hughes men bought every copy of Confidential off every newsstand in Los Angeles. Hughes had long been paranoid about his relationships. He even hired detectives to make sure his girlfriends weren't seeing other men or talking to the press. When he'd discover somebody new, he'd put a surveillance on him. So he had to check him out that way. During the 1950s, Hughes used his film producer status and considerable wealth to attract and control women. He did so by promising to make them stars. He can tell them what to do. He can put them under contract. But Hughes went far beyond the norm. He rented apartments and houses for his girlfriends and starlets. Along with their salaries, he paid for acting, voice, and dance lessons. He also dictated what they ate, wore, and who they saw. If they could not date, they, they were pretty confined in their activity. He had the innate need to control. Some of them, he wouldn't see anymore, but he kept sending them checks. There was 80-some checks that went out every month for people that, just to keep them quiet. With his women stashed around town like prisoners, Hughes moved surreptitiously around town from bed to bed, but not before he sent each to his personal doctor. He'd have his doctor check them out, make sure they didn't have any diseases. But what the women didn't know was that Hughes was hiding something about himself. 
Sometime in the 1930s or early 40s, he's reported to have contracted syphilis. The first revelation about Hughes having syphilis came from Noah Dietrich, who worked closely with Hughes for a number of years. Dietrich talks about how Hughes had contracted syphilis in the mid-1930s uh, from one of the blonde actresses he was dating at the time. Hughes developed blisters on the palms of his hands. His doctors immediately diagnosed the disease as syphilis and told him not to shake hands with anyone for six weeks. It was the beginning of another lasting phobia. Accounts vary about how Hughes may have treated the disease, probably taking a combination of mercury and arsenic, known as the magic bullet, and possibly the experimental cure of the day, penicillin. Syphilis in those years could be easily killed by antibiotics. I assume they gave Howard Hughes antibiotics in the hospital when he had his plane crash. So therefore, if he'd have had syphilis, it would have been killed. At the autopsy, doctors reported no residual effects of syphilis in his brain tissue. So people still debate whether he actually had the disease. But for Howard Hughes, just the word syphilis played heavily into his lifelong fear of contamination. It wreaked havoc on his mental state. By the mid-1950s, Howard Hughes' growing health issues began affecting the day-to-day -day operation of his increasingly complicated business empire. He now owned the RKO movie studio, which solidified his mogul status in Hollywood. He was also building an enormous aerospace company that was developing top secret communications and spy technologies along with aircraft for the military. And then there was TWA, the airline Hughes transformed into an industry giant by introducing the first transcontinental flights in the late 1940s which he had personally pioneered as a test pilot in the 30s. Keeping TWA solvent would create huge financial problems for Hughes, but those would pale in comparison to the physical and emotional crisis he was about to go through. Over the next decade, Howard Hughes would make many enemies, including some within his own organization and inside his own mind. In 1947, at the age of 42, Howard Hughes appeared before Congress to testify about alleged improprieties in his government contracts. Some believed he was a war profiteer, which Hughes strongly denied. The impression gained by the public was that I made $15 million on the $40 million of war contracts under examination here. Well, I, I can assure you that there's nothing in the record to indicate that. Well, there's certainly plenty in the press to indicate. Hughes gave a commanding performance, and by rallying public opinion to his side, he flexed true power and influence on Capitol Hill. It was one of the last times Howard Hughes would appear in public. By the age of 50, he'd completely transformed his image from that of a famous, visible millionaire to a mysterious, invisible tycoon. He didn't want people to see him anymore. Some of this had to do with the XF-11 plane crash in 1946, which left him scarred, disfigured, and increasingly dependent on painkillers that he secretly administered himself. Eventually, his daily doses rose to eight times that given to new patients. This man's taking up to 45 grains of codeine a day. This man's taking up to 150 milligrams of Valium a day. Hughes' retreat from society was also a manifestation of his undiagnosed mental disorder. Howard Hughes is in his 50s and, and, and has very, very severe OCD. There's no doubt in my mind that that had a lot to do with, with 